I'm, um... I'm terribly sorry for your loss. I said for about the thousandth time in the last hour. What was left of the earthly remains of Barry Yin sat in one of the nicest caskets that I had on hand, and there wasn't a dry eye in the place as his son finished a eulogy that would likely have Malcolm Von Trask tearing up. I had felt bad for Lee when he had to follow up his uncle, Gabe Yin, but it appeared that he had brought his A-game. His uncle Gabe was a great orator, but as Lee finished talking about his father and childhood spent in the arcade, I found that even I was tearing up some. After that came the closing of the casket, and the taking of the body to have it cremated. I had offered to do it here, but I had been assured that Mr. Yin had wanted his cremation handled in deference to his Taoist beliefs. It was why I had agreed to rent the casket to his widow, something that I usually did not do, so he could be viewed in something nicer than just a pine box. He would be transferred to something more crematorium-friendly for his final journey, and as I shoot out the last of the mourners, I was glad that it was finally over. Dad had always said that one of the hardest things to do as a mortician was to bury people that you knew. And I understood why he buried monsters now. People in town, especially like Mr. Yin, were always the hardest to see in the earth. I had a lot of fond memories at Mr. Yin's arcade, and I was sad to hear that Lee wouldn't be taking it up. Lee and I had been friends growing up, and he even got me into Yu-Gi-Oh! With my crowning achievement not being a high score on one of the arcade games, but having finally defeated Lee in a duel once. But now Lee was an architect, and over drinks he told me that he hated that he was going to have to sell the place. He just didn't have time to work for the firm in Corbin and run an arcade here in Puce. I wish that it could be otherwise, he said, looking sad. I have a lot of really good memories with you inside that place. His uncle was going to take it over, buying Lee out. But though Gabe was a great speaker, it was widely known that he was just a bad businessman. The Yin Fun Land and Arcade would probably be out of business within two years, and I hated that, even as I wondered if some of the arcade cabinets would look good in the showroom. A guy has to diversify, after all. The last lady had passed over the threshold then, clutching my hands and thanking me for the beautiful service, and I watched her go before shutting the door and heading back up to the aisle to start cleaning. I needed to spend some time in my office working on the books before turning in. I needed to clean up the fellowship hall because I wasn't sure that I wanted to do it tomorrow. I needed to eat the dinner upstairs that was probably cold and brush my teeth since I hadn't yesterday, as well as get some sleep so I could get up and conduct business tomorrow. When you own your own business, it always seems like it's an excuse to set your own hours to be your own boss. But they never tell you that being your own boss means working twice as a regular Joe. I just started lifting the first of the flower wreaths, preparing to set them in the entryway so that way the family could get them, when I saw that there was still one guest left. She was a wisp of a thing, her black dress more of a shroud. It seemed to float around her, like someone floating beneath the water, and her face was firmly in her hands. She was shuddering, as if weeping bitterly, and I stepped back from the wreath to see if I could assist her. She looked very old and very frail. Had her family forgotten her? The closer that I got, the worse that it seemed to become. Her arms were so thin that I could see the bones in her hands. Her hair was brittle and unkempt, looking ready to fall off as if it clung to her scalp. Her chest was so sunken in, and she looked like an escaped corpse. Ma'am, uh, are you okay? And she continued to cry for weeping a silent and off-putting thing. Ma'am, I understand what you're going through, but the service is over. Is there someone that I can call for you, your children or husband maybe? I started to reach out for her, wanting to comfort this clearly grieving woman. But something stopped me. It was like my fingers met an invisible barrier around her, and some old survival instinct suddenly filled me with the notion that it might be a very bad idea to touch her. She had stopped shaking, her hands still trembling, and as my hands hung motionless in the air before her, she dropped her hands and turned those terrible eyes towards me. I was screaming before I could stop myself. Her skin was the color of oatmeal, and the association did not end there. Her skin was nearly curdy, like it was rotting off of her 
and the holes in her face looked like deep pits worked into the curdled flesh. Those pits seemed to hold nothing but dark promises of a slow and terrible death. As her hands came down, she screamed like a run-over cat, and the sound enveloped my own scream and threw it back into my face. Her scream hit me like a physical force, and my hands came jerkily up to my ears as I tried to escape on legs that weren't fully under my control. My eyes watered, my body shook, and when I stumbled through the side door and fell hard on my ass, it was probably the best thing that could have happened. I lay there, ears ringing, and when I took my hands down I expected to find them wet with blood. I could still hear that screaming as it rattled inside of my skull, and I was breathing heavily as I reached for the door to see what that had been. Had I picked up a banshee somewhere? That was more than the other crowd's specialty, but as I shoved at the door with a shaky hand, I made ready for whatever might be on the other side. This was my mortuary, damn it, and I wasn't going to get kicked out by some boogan with an axe to grind. The door swung inward on squeaky hinges and I was presented with nothing. The flowers were exactly where I'd left them. The benches were still littered with pamphlets and random junk. The lights still reflected the polish that I had put on the benches earlier. It was quiet. Too quiet. And I wondered if maybe I had just dozed off for a moment. No. No, I wasn't that tired. Something had definitely happened here. I went back to my work on the wreaths, pulling them and the flowers that had been brought for the service into the foyer. The whole time that I worked, I could swear I felt eyes watching me. And I didn't see anything. Not really. But I felt as if I did see something. Out of the corner of my eye, lurking in the peripherals. And I hated catching sight of it. I worked quickly to clean up the mess, the fellowship hall still looking a little used when I finally cut the lights and left. It had taken twice as long as it should have, and I knew that it was the creeping dread that was threatening to take hold of me with every step. I staggered into my office, closing the doors behind me as I tried to get my mind in order so that I could do some work. I needed to do some bookkeeping. The end of the third quarter was coming up, and I'd had three normal funerals that I needed to get to in the ledgers. I also needed to fudge a little or explain how I was paying the bills on this place while holding just a funeral a month for the three months that I had been in charge around here. That wasn't so hard. The Gorgon funeral and the Incubi funeral had been more than enough to pay off the taxes and the service costs on this place for the next two years, but I still had to make it look good. Otherwise, I'd come face to face with the fearsome beast that was the IRS, and they did not do you the courtesy of killing you outright. They did it slowly, painfully, psychologically. As I worked on the books, I could feel the same creeping dread slinking into my office on tiny feet. Every creak, every car going by on the highway, every bird crap that hit the roof was suddenly the sound of that emaciated creature getting closer and closer to me. My eyes kept flicking up to the dark corners of my office, but there was nothing to see. The stained glass Dad had in the office cast rainbows across the walls in the dying light of the afternoon. And those rainbows seemed to hide my uninvited guest. I could feel her looking at me, slinking closer, trying to get in on my blind side, but when I looked up, she was never anywhere to be found. I gritted my teeth as I looked back down. But when I snapped my eyes back up, she was there, <laughs> inches from my face. Her eyes were even darker this close up, twin holes of mirthless, murky water. She was perched on the edge of my desk, her nails pulling up ribbons of wood as she leaned forward and her mouth was set into an unnatural O of agony. There was no smell. Something that surprised me, but it was something that I found hard to be thankful for as the surprise washed over me. I said some words my mom probably would have scolded me for, and suddenly my father's ancient rolling chair was going over backwards. The heavy old thing had casters on it thick enough to take your arm off, and I hit the ground with an almighty thump. I scrambled around, trying to get out from under the chair so I didn't get trapped in looking for any sign of the ghost woman. 
She had been right on the edge of my desk, leering at me like the world's ugliest gargoyle, and now she was simply gone. I tried to get control of my galloping heartbeat as I glanced around, but as I set the chair back up, I knew the bookkeeping was over for the night. I'd go upstairs and eat and head to bed so that way I could get some actual work done tomorrow. I don't know what this was, but I assumed that it was grief or maybe lack of sleep. I hadn't been sleeping well. What with Mr. Yin having passed and my recent nighttime visitors, and I couldn't think of anything else that it could be besides nerves and exhaustion. I just needed a good night's sleep. That was all. Just a good night's sleep. Hell, I just needed some sleep. I was repeating myself. That wasn't a good sign. I came into the dark kitchen I found my dinner in the microwave under clear film. Mom had gone to bed, as she had turned in early these days, and as I took the cover off the food, I wished that she had still been up. I wanted to talk to her about the service, about Mr. Yin, and I was a little sorry to have to eat alone. I put the food in the microwave, hit the button, and watched as it spun. Mom had made meatloaf, it appeared. The mashed potatoes and peas looked tasty as they sat beside it. Mom knew how much I loved meatloaf and mashed potatoes, and my mouth was already watering as I thought about it. When the light went out inside, I saw something besides food in the now dark window of the microwave. Someone was standing behind me, leaning against the immaculately clean sink and staring at me. I turned, grabbing the closest thing to hand and slung the whole knife block onto the floor as the carving knife came free. The kitchen was empty except for me, and after brandishing the long, thin blade for a little sweeping around as if someone might be hiding, before picking up the knives and taking my food out of the microwave. I really, really needed to get some sleep. It was good, and as I ate, I felt a little better. My eyes still flicked around, my brain on high alert, but... As the meatloaf disappeared and the warm taste of mom's cooking filled my belly, I started to feel more like myself. It was just the nerves, that was all. I was just freaking myself out. I was letting my fear get the better of me, and as I sighed and let my nerves and adrenaline ebb, I felt like I could sleep for days. I had just wanted to shower before bed. The formal shirt that I wore always made me sweaty, but I decided then and there that it was straight to bed for this guy. I was suddenly afraid of passing out in all that steam and breaking my neck, and I knew that in my current state, what I really needed was eight or nine uninterrupted hours. I stiffened when I heard someone enter the kitchen, but as the light, familiar footsteps came towards me, I sighed in relief. It was just mom. Sorry, uh, I didn't mean to wake you up, I said, and she didn't say a word. Mom came up behind me and put her hands on my shoulders, leaning against me and offering me her stability. She had done it often enough when I was a kid, and it still made me feel safe to this day to have her so close. Dad and I had always been close, but Mom was my rock. She was the stability a kid craves, and it was nice to have her if I couldn't have Dad. I guess I'm just tired and my nerves are all jangled. I'm... We buried Mr. Yin today. You remember him. I haven't been to the arcade in a few years, but I wish that I had gone for a visit. I'll always see him standing behind the counter, dispensing tokens and prizes, you know. I wish that Lee was taking it over. Gabe will do a good job, but no one will replace Mr. Yen. I... I started tearing up, and I was glad for my mother's strong hands as she rubbed my neck and shoulders. I... <sighs> hmm... <sighs> I don't know why I'm taking this so hard. I just... He was just such a huge part of my childhood, you know. I, I don't know if it was seeing him in the box or hearing all the things that the other people had to say about him, but, you know... But it really got to me. I put my head in my hands as my mother rubbed my shoulders. And as I tried to get a control of myself, I became aware of how bony her hands had become. Mom had lost some weight since Dad's death, but I didn't realize that it had gotten this bad. I had been in my own little world for the last few months, and maybe it was time I paid a little more attention to her. If she had lost this much weight, 
I'd be burying her soon if I wasn't careful. Thank you, Mom. I'm glad that you're here to help me through this. In a lot of ways, losing Mr. Yen was like losing Dad again. I know how this sounds, but I don't think that I could do this without you. I had reached up as I spoke and put a hand on her cold body digit. But when I looked up into the face of the woman behind me, my smile curdled and my words turned to ash in my mouth. It was not my mother. It was the ghost that had haunted me since the funeral. Her face was frozen in a rictus of agony, and when she looked down at me with those black pits, I heard something spilling from her open, dark mouth. It was a death rattle, a sound of frozen vocal cords and dead tissue. I pulled away so violently that I knocked the table over, and as the remains of my dinner went spilling across the linoleum, I fell hard on my elbow and yelped in pain as I scooted away from the specter. But she just stood there, looming like a piece of Halloween decoration, and somewhere between the blinks, she vanished. And I was left panting on the floor of the kitchen, looking around for the source of my fear. After sitting in the cooling gravy for a count of 30, I slowly got up and started to clean the kitchen. I winced as I bent the elbow that I had come down on, knowing that it was going to swell tomorrow. And I winced again as I noticed that Mom's cow salt shaker was in two pieces. That poor heifer had spilled its powdery guts all over the floor and I swept it up and looked for the hot glue gun. It wasn't the first time that the cow had been returned whole again, but I was afraid that one more time might be the end of it. I set it out to dry, its mate undamaged somehow, and I turned to go to bed. All of this seemed familiar somehow, but I just couldn't put my finger on it. Clearly, this was something more than nerves and lack of sleep, but I was just too tired to make sense of it. Sleep. I just needed sleep. If I could get my mind right again, then I could figure this out. Was it a ghost? A new client? Or something else entirely? I didn't know. But I wanted to find out. Of course, after some shut-eye and a chance to think it over. I fell fully clothed on the bed and into the old nighttime. I found myself running through the woods limbs whipping at my face as something chased me. I kept coming back to this damn dream, and I was just wondering why. When had this happened? I didn't ever remember running scared through the woods like this, but I suppose that it must have happened at some point. I dreamed about this too often for it to just be a passing fancy. I was charging through the hanging branches, feeling them clutching at me as I took off towards... something. Something was behind me something big. And if it caught me, I was dead. I don't know how old I was, I don't know how long that I had been running, but when I heard my dad's voice, I started heading towards it. Tyler! Dad! Come on, son! Dad, please! Please help me, Dad! Come on, Tyler! Dad would make the monsters go away, and I would feel safe. And I kept turning, running closer and closer to the sound of his voice, and when I saw him in the road, I ran towards him and jumped into his arms, wrapping him into a huge bear hug. I expected Dad to run, but instead he stood his ground, and spoke to the thing without even the slightest hint of a stutter or step. He was so confident. Get ye hence, devil. This is my son, and he is under the protection of my house. I had never heard Dad talk like that, and it was a little jarring. Then a slithery voice came from behind me, and I buried my face in my dad's chest like it might protect me. He was in my woods, Mortician. He has violated the pact. He is a child, and my responsibility. I will take his punishment. What is it that you require to remove the dead? Skin. It hissed, and all at once there were hands on me. Hands with bony fingers. Hands without heat, and they were poking at my skin and digging at my body. I thrashed and moved, trying to kick it off, but as I came awake, I became aware that I was dreaming. I moved, but there was a weight on me. 
and I growled in disgust. <sighs> Not again. Talia, I told you both that I didn't want to find you in my bed again. Or is it Victoria this time? Get out now before I... But when I whipped the covers back, it was not my nocturnal vixen. The gray lady had folded herself around me, her arms so tight that I thought that I would suffocate. She was squeezing and grabbing, holding me like a vice, and I was having real trouble drawing breath. She was crushing me to death, and as I drew in enough breath to cry out, I felt her climb up my chest like a constrictor. Her terrible face was so close to mine, her corpsey features threatened to touch mine, and I felt as if I could gladly shut her right out of my body. She was like the worst kind of paralysis demon made real, and I was powerless against her. And when the door opened, I was afraid of what it might be. But when my mother gasped and came fully into the room, I was suddenly even more afraid for her. I needn't have been, though. In the name of the Father, in the Son, in the Holy Spirit, I command you to leave him and get ye hence. The old corpse screamed again, screamed like she had in the fellowship hall, and I felt it vibrate my whole body. I did feel wetness this time, blood sliding down my head as my eardrums oozed and she unwound from me as she dissipated into a fine mist. She fell apart, passing through the floor and away as quickly as she had materialized. I clutched my ears, moaning softly as I tried to access the damage. The left one was definitely burst, but there was still some ringing in the right, so I guess that was a good sign. I knew they would likely heal. I had a lot of ear infections as a kid, and it wasn't the first time an eardrum had burst. But I knew that it would put a damper on my life until they did. I looked at mom, wanting to thank her for saving my life, but she was mouthing something at me that I couldn't hear. I turned my good ear to hear her, and through the ringing, I only just picked it up. It didn't make sense at first, but as she repeated it, I knew it meant that something had happened that mom had seen before, and it wasn't good. We have to call Father Pierce. I'm afraid that she's back. We need to call Father Pierce. Who's back? I yelled without meaning to, following her up to the hallways as she ran for the kitchen. Mom, who's back? I gripped her shoulders and she seemed like she wouldn't tell me at first. Finally, though, she whispered the names and the word I read from her lips sent a shudder through me. Mrs. Black. Mrs. Black.